welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. And pull your Bibles open to Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25. In Acts chapter 25, we are going to see continuation from Paul having to give an account. People are after this man for standing for the gospel and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And some people are very upset by this. He's doing the right thing, but he's put, in a sense, on trial. Have you ever been put on trial for doing the right thing? You've had people try to throw stones at you for doing the right thing. And you're like, God, what are you doing? How can you let this happen? Well, here is a man who's not complaining to God about this. He's standing and even staring at the opposition in the face of adversity. And he's not holding back. I'm going to start and put you on the spot, Mr. Wiseman, on the media there. I'm going to go just a few verses before we start in chapter 25. Can we take a run up? Uh, Acts chapter 24, I'm going to read from verse 24 onwards. It says, After some days Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So there is some political tension going on here. There is a transition of power from Felix to Festus, who was a governor, and there is a great population of Jewish people living in the region. And the governor wants to curry some favor. He's also in it for his own gain. He wants a little bit of money from Paul to be let out. Paul refuses to do that. I love that um, there is the opportunity to compromise, but he holds to integrity. If ever there's a time where we're seeing compromise in our world, it's got to be now. And the compromise, might I submit to you, is not just out there, it's in the family of God. I wonder if God is calling his people to a greater standard in this hour of integrity, like we see Paul. Amen or ouch. So we see Paul holding to integrity. He's not throwing money aside, but we notice there that he is locked up for how long? Two years. Now let's start chapter 25. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea and the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. The enemy was using these Jewish leaders to set up an ambush. He was using people. The enemy will do this. He will look to set up an ambush against you and against me. And how does he do it? It may not be as obvious as demons with horns holding pitchforks. So obvious. The enemy uses people and circumstances to try to trip you up. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 what Satan is like. Be watchful, be sober, because the enemy, he looks to prowl around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Our enemy has been around for a while, and he knows the nature of humanity. He's a student of carnality. He knows how to trip us up. So we've got to be wise. Be careful of any ambush that the Lord might 
be allowing you to be exposed to. The Lord doesn't do it, but he allows it. It's Satan that sets it up. And here we see that uh, there was an ambush by the Jewish leaders. And I, I can't help but consider that time frame of how long was that again? Two years. For two years, Paul was held. He was held in captivity. He was given certain allowances, but he was still held. He, he, he really shouldn't be held for that long. But he was because there was some sort of political pull there. But I wonder what those Jewish leaders would have been going through for two years. And then after two years, they still want to kill him. Two years is a long time. Can you imagine the bitterness and the rage in their heart that after two years, they're setting up an, up an ambush? After two years? He's preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. He's preaching, G, uh, Paul is preaching righteousness. And these Jewish leaders are still trying to get him after two years. They're after him. That's also important for us to realize that bitterness can bind us. Don't let bitterness bind you. Don't let bitterness bind you. Two years after Paul is experiencing this, knowing what's going on here in Acts chapter 25, he writes to the church at Ephesus. He says this in chapter 4, verse 31, 32, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. He's writing that to Christians. So bitterness is not just something that the unbelievers or the not yet believers experience. Paul knows how bad this is. Hebrews talks about a root of bitterness. Brothers and sisters, we can't allow bitterness to fester in our hearts. One person says that bitterness is like trying to drink a poison and expecting someone else to pay for it. Is there bitterness in your heart this morning toward someone or about something? Are you holding on to resentment perhaps? Malice. Wrath. Unforgiveness. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15, it tells us, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Hmm. Don't let bitterness bind you. Here's a quote from Yvonne Lim. Live the let go life. Live the let go life. Live the let go life. Galatians 5 verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. What's interesting about this is Paul writes this to a group of Christians and he's saying, he's talking about freedom, but he's referring to going back into legalism. And religion. Do you know even religion binds you up? You can become religiously bitter. In fact, that's what's going on here. These, these God-fearing, bothering Jewish leaders, they didn't know Jesus. They were just bound up with religion. They were religious. They thought that they were probably doing the right thing, but they weren't in trying to kill Paul. Religion does that. In fact, Religion restricts, it incarcerates, but Jesus liberates. You can be a Christian believer, but still be quite religious in your ways. And that very life of trying to be religious, living by legalistic rules and regulations, binds you up. It can kill you. It can. 
So my question is, are you religious this morning? The difference with Christ is this whole idea of grace. Religion pushes us in a way. It tries to condition us to get close to God because God is up there. But the gospel and Jesus is all about God coming to us. That's grace. But religion in some way thinks, if I can just do this, if I just say that, and then I can just get approved of and loved by and seen by God. No, God's already done that for you. It's freely given as a grace gift. So give it to God. Even religion kills. Check out the Spanish Inquisition of the 15th century or the Salem witch trials. These are people that that would say that they're Christians. Bitterness is bad for us emotionally. It can lead to unresolved anger, resentment, can weigh heavily on us. Prevents us from experiencing the peace that only comes from forgiveness and grace in God. Not just emotionally, what about relationally? Bitterness can damage relationships with family, friends and other believers. It can lead to isolation, fragmentation of communities. What about eternally in the context of witness? A Christian that lives in bitterness looks like they're sucking on lemons all day long. They're so sour and they tell you about the love of God. Do you know mentally and physically bitterness can destroy you? Proverbs 14, 30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. We can see the connection. Stress and immunity, watch this. There was a study that found psychological stress, uh, stress can decrease immune response, making individuals more susceptible, susceptible to illness. Also, cardiovascular health. A study uh, from the American Journal of Cardiology, they found that individuals who reported high levels of anger and resentment had an increased risk of heart disease. Mental health, a study in the Journal of um, Clinical Psychology found that negative emotions can exacerbate symptoms of depression. Another study found that individuals who practice forgiveness, though, and let go of resentment tend to report higher levels of life satisfaction and overall well-being. Here's a question we can ask ourselves. What do I need to hand over to Jesus? <laughs> Is there anything that's unhealthy and unhelpful that we're harboring in our hearts? And, and if Holy Spirit shows you, what will you do with it? What I do from time to time is as I'm praying and I ask myself that question, I bring it before the Lord, I, I look at people's faces and situations be it in the present or in the past and I think what is my disposition toward that person and that often gives me an idea of where things are at is there anything we've got to let go of and give to him these Jewish leaders they really wanted this guy dead and Paul knew it let's read on Verse 4, Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me and if there's anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea and the next day he took his seat on the, tribu the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesarea have I committed any offense. So there were many and serious accusations coming against Paul, and Paul would not have a bar of it. Perhaps you're here this morning and you have had many 
and serious accusations made against you. The question is, will you let it stick or not? There are times the Lord will say, I want you to say nothing. There are other times he will say, I want you to speak up. Here in this occasion, Paul was having none of it. Never give oxygen to the lies about you. Never give oxygen to the lies about you. That is, whatever people have said about you, these accusations, these lies, whatever it is, don't let it get in there and hold you. I before, I've before uh, uh, shared with you an illustration I tell my girls about when people say things against you, when they tease you or they mock you or whatever it is, you've got to let it roll off you like water off a duck's back. And I say to my girls, girls, you've got to turn into a duck and you've got to activate duck feathers mode. And it's a visual representation for them. One of them, in fact, said, Act, when, when, when someone else at school was saying things, activating duck feathers mode. <laughs> because they picture duck feathers growing. And then when things are said, it just rolls off. What lies have been said about you? Will you let it stick? Or will you let it roll off? Never give oxygen to those lies. We know, of course, who accuses us, don't we? Revelation 12, verse 10. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. And watch this, watch this, watch this. So we understand, we know from the scriptures that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But the next bit is important. Who accuses them day and night before God. Constant accusations being made against us. Constantly. And that comes from Satan. But the truth will set you free. So stand on the truth. John chapter 8 verse 32 tells us, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. So we have the enemy, he's accusing us and he accuses us with lies. And in fact, in John chapter 10, Jesus has a crack at these religious people. And he says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. Chapter 8, verse 44. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. I recently had someone make some very nasty allegations about me, like nasty. And the first thing that I try to do whenever someone presents me with something is, is I go into seeking out truth mode. I try to not let it get too personal. I just step back and go, all right, Lord, what's the truth there? Whether I like it or not is irrelevant, it's secondary. What's the truth there? And so I looked at it, I'm like, oh, that's not even close. That's not even close. That's not even close. If there is truth there, I want to stand on the side of truth. Sometimes you'll be accused of something that is truthful and might have submit to you, take it on and take it to God. But if it's not there, water off a duck's back. And so in this moment, I could have got so upset. This is, I just felt genuine sadness for the person that was saying this about me. I said, the truth will sort it out. And have a guess what? It did. I'm not going to waste my emotional energy or time getting upset about things or opinions. or It doesn't matter to me. Because I know who is behind all of this. I'm not going to get upset with people in the natural so much as, as, as what's going on behind. People and situations and circumstances are just agents to try and get to us. That's what's going on here. We want the truth to set us free. Accusations are going to happen often. 
we see throughout the scriptures that there are numerous times that God's people are doing the right thing and false accusations are made. David um, was one of these people. First Samuel chapter 24, he spares Saul's life. And he confronts Saul about being falsely accused of trying to harm him despite him being loyal. Stephen in Acts chapter 6 was accused of blasphemy against Moses and God, leading to his arrest and eventual death. He was falsely accused. What about Jesus? During his trial, there were false witnesses that testified against him. It was part of God's plan. What accusations have you bought into? That's a question we can all ask ourselves. What accusations have I bought into? I'm not important. I'm not valuable. My prayers don't matter because I've got sin in my life. Because I'm not as holy as I think I should, I'm not going to succeed. These are lies and accusations that God's Holy Spirit says, no, 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 come on, come on, come on. It's not because of our goodness or it's not because of our righteousness that we are loved, seen, affirmed, approved of. It's because of Jesus and what he's done and who he is. That makes, that makes it so much easier for me. So I don't depend upon my righteousness I depend upon his. I throw myself at his feet. And then the loving heavenly father sees me, affirms me, knows me through the filter and the lens of Jesus and what was accomplished for me on the cross. I'm not going to buy into the accusations or the lies. Neither should any of us. Verse 9 says this, But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. I love this verse. If then I am a wrongdoer, and if I have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I don't seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered to Caesar, you have appealed to Caesar, you shall go. Remember the story of Acts, the ark is how God, by His Holy Spirit, moves through everyday believers to not just transform them, but the world that they live in. Specifically, how the gospel goes from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then all the way to the uttermost parts of the world, ends up in Rome. Paul was at this point, at this critical juncture. He knows that he's, he's in Caesarea, and if he goes to Jerusalem, that, that could be the end of it, but he really wanted to go to Rome. That's what God had put in his heart. In fact, it says, Acts 19, 21. Now, after these, this is a few chapters ago, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. But then again, after a couple of chapters in chapter 23, it says, the following night, the Lord stood by Paul and said, take courage for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify me about me in Rome. So the Lord himself says, hey, listen, you're going to end up in Rome. But Paul's there going, what am I going to do? Should I, should I pay my way out of this? Should I just go with the flow and be passive? No, he holds to his guns. And there are times, brothers and sisters, we've got to hold firm to truthfulness and justice. We've got to stand up for ourselves at times. We, 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 we've got to throw our shoulders back and go, hang on a second, no. I'm going to trust in God's plan. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He's keeping his cool and he's trusting the plan. Maybe that's a word for someone this morning. 
Keep your cool and trust the plan. What is the plan that God's got before you? What has he put in your heart? No matter what it looks like in the natural, he is working something out. You might feel as I've taken a detour here and there. Trust in the plan. Trust in the process. Trust in the promises. Trust in the person of Jesus. He will get it done. We're seeing here the providence of God in this situation, in this whole story, that God, in the midst of, of, of political corruption, in the midst of opposition, culturally, we're seeing that God still will do what he wants to do. And Paul is being challenged. He's trusting the plan. I wonder what a caterpillar feels like. Instinctively, it, 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 it goes and it forms into a chrysalis and it just sits there, caterpillar. Have you ever seen that happen in fast mode? A caterpillar just sits there in a cocoon and over time, it's wiggling, it's moving, it's dark, it's, it just comes out as a butterfly. Instinctively, a caterpillar just does what it does. It trusts the plan, it trusts the process, it's inbuilt. Now for us as believers, we have flesh and spirit at war and our flesh says, no, I want to get this done myself, I want to do it, I want to make it happen, I don't know what this looks like, but I'm just going to force my way through. But instinctively, the Holy Spirit says, ah, just trust. Trust the plan. Just trust. Because God knows what he's doing. We may not know what he's doing. And here there is a bit of a, a, a problem for Paul. But we, through this problem, see the promises fulfilled. God turns dilemmas into doorways. And that's what's happening here. If then I'm a wrongdoer and I've committed anything for which I deserve to die, I don't seek to escape death. But if there's nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar, especially as a Roman. He had every right to have this appeal to Caesar in Rome. He had this right and he stood on that. And there was... A danger, a dilemma, but we see in that it was a doorway that led to the fulfillment of God's promises. In the Old Testament, we see Daniel with this example. He faced a dilemma of being taken captive and exiled to Babylon. And he had to navigate a foreign culture that opposed his faith. But he committed to prayer. He refused to compromise. And that led to opportunities before King Nebuchadnezzar and ultimately serve in amongst the highest positions of authority. That was all used for God's glory. What about Joseph as another example? Joseph faced a dilemma of being uh, sold into slavery by his brothers. He was later in prison for a crime he didn't commit. But those hardships allowed him to a pathway that helped interpret dreams become second command in Egypt. Hmm. It's interesting how God uses situations like that for his glory. And I wonder if he can turn around your situation. I wonder if, if your season of despair is a doorway for the destiny that he has for you. Let's not write God off just yet. God's sovereign. Romans tells us that he uses all things, all things together for good, for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Even in unjust circumstances, God's sovereignty still seems to work. I want to show a picture of a lady named Fanny Crosby. This lady here passed away over 100 years ago, lived to the ripe old age of 94 years old. This lady wrote over 8,000 hymns. 
8,000 hymns. Probably the most famous that she wrote was the song Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. You know that one? Oh, man. Well, in her autobiography, she wrote in 1903, She gives this account of this lady. You see, she's got glasses on there. She's blind there. She wasn't born blind, but she became blind when she was very young. And she became blind through um, treatment given from a doctor. In all of this, though, and particularly in that book, she expresses her thankfulness to God that in his providence, she did become blind. She was thankful for it. Six weeks old, she had inflammation in her eyes. The doctor who tried to help her mistakenly destroyed those eyes. And through that, she became blind for the rest of her life. But you know what she says in her book? If she could meet that doctor, she would say thank you. Thank you over and over again for making me blind for it was through your agency that it came about why would she do that can i read a a a quote i'll summarize a quote she says it seemed intended by the blessed providence of god that i should be blind all my life and i thank him for the dispensation i was born with a pair of of as good eyes as any baby baby ever owned. But when I was six weeks of age, a slight touch of inflammation came upon them and they were put under the care of a physician. What he did to them or what happened in spite of them, I don't know, but it resulted in their permanent destruction so far as seeing is concerned. And I was doomed to blindness all the rest of my earthly existence. I've heard that this physician never ceased expressing his regret at the occurrence. And that it was one of the sorrows of his life. But if I could meet him now, I would say, thank you, thank you, over and over again for making me blind. If it was through your agency, for it was through your agency that it came about. She goes on to write, although it may have been a blunder on the physician's part, it was no mistake of God's. I verily believe it was his intention that I should live my days in physical darkness. So as to better, be better prepared to sing his praises and incite others so to do. I could not have written thousands of hymns, many of which, if you will pardon me for repeating it, are sung all over the world. If I had been hindered by the distractions of seeing all the interesting and beautiful objects that would have been presented to my notice. One other reason she gives While I'm deprived of many splendid sights, which, as above mentioned, might draw me away from the principal work of my life, I've also been spared the seeing of great many unpleasant things she's been spared from. Wow. The merciful God has put his hand over my eyes and shut out from me the sight of many instances of cruelty and bitter unkindness and misfortune that I would not have been able to relieve and must simply have suffered in seeing. I am content with what I can know of life through the four senses I possess. Practically unimpaired, at 83 years of age, hearing, tasting, smelling and feeling are still left in their fullest degree. She lived another 11 years after writing that. 94 years old, over 100 years ago, the Lord gave her, granted her an incredible life and she is thankful for what many might consider to be the absence of God. But in his providence, he does things like that. He turns moments of possible despair into doorways to the fulfillment of his promises. Is your problem in life at the moment a doorway? to the fulfillment of his promises. Or 
or we're just going to complain about them. When I first read of that story, I got really emotional. I'm thinking, my goodness me. Wow, Lord, would you do a work in me? Teach me contentment, gratitude, gratefulness. Help me to see the good, the way that you see things. Not the way that I do, because I tend to be a little bit of a pessimist sometimes. What I don't have, what I lack. But in the process, God does something phenomenal. The beautiful story that we're going to see continue in Acts. And we've already seen numerous occasions where what seems to be a hindrance or a hurdle, God turns around for his glory. Would we stand together? And we're going to pray. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. I want to spend some time just waiting on the Lord just now. And there are three questions that I want us to ask. The first one is, what do I need to hand over to Jesus? What do I need to give him? What do I need to place at the feet of the cross? What baggage am I carrying around on me? Do I, just take it off. Give it to him. Let him deal with it. Give it to him. But you've got to let it go first. First question, what do I need to hand over to Jesus? The second question, what accusations have I bought into? What accusations about me have I bought into? What lies? And the final question is, is my problem a doorway into fulfilling his promises, for his purposes. Can we pray into that just now? If you're comfortable, would you just raise your hands in surrender and openness to God? We're going to ask Holy Spirit to just do a work in our hearts, particularly as we bring those questions and we reflect on that in his presence. Loving Father, we come to you in the only name that matters. It's the name of Jesus. It's in the person of Jesus. We come in and through him and we come asking those particular questions of you. Lord, are we holding on to things that we need to give to you? Is there resentment in our hearts, unforgiveness in our hearts? Is there bitterness in our hearts? Are we holding on to things that are unhealthy, unhelpful? Lord, we also ask... Are there accusations that we've taken on that we shouldn't be taking on? Are there lies that, we, that we've allowed to creep into our hearts? Lord, would you help us to see the truth? But Lord, we also ask, are there, is there a doorway into your designed destiny for us that just looks like despair right now, or dilemma right now, or danger right now, would you help us see? I'm going to ask the band to lead us, and they're going to sing, and I encourage you, feel free to sing as well, but let's not let the time go by where we're just reflecting with God, waiting in His presence, and asking Holy Spirit to speak to us, because in just a few minutes, we're going to ask Him to help us deal with this. Let's just spend a few moments just now as the band leads us with those questions before us. Thank you, Father, for your presence. Speak to us, we ask now, in this window, in Jesus' name. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.